Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH. And today we're gonna take a look at this thing right here, which is the Arista 7060CX32S. Now this switch has a total of 32 100 gigabit ethernet ports. It has certainly been out for quite a while now, but when this was brand new and the Broadcom Tomahawk was like the chip, the switch chip to go get, this switch sold for just under $1,000 a port, which is quite a bit when you have 32 100 gig ports. Now what you might have seen on STH is that this is definitely not the first 100 gig switch teardown that we've done. We've already done an edge core switch. We've done a Celestica switch. And I think we also have a Dell Z9100 that we haven't taken apart yet because it's well running in the data center. So that's... That's the reason we haven't done that one yet, but I wanted to give some sense of what something like this looks like because, you know, it used to be a very expensive technology. Nowadays, still, this is not necessarily a cheap switch. And so I want to just show you guys what it looks like inside, how these switches are made. And then I want to talk a little bit about what the impact of these switches are and what the path forward is. All right, so let's take a look at the front of the switch and let's get to the exciting part first. What you're going to see here is you're going to see a total of 32 100 gigabit ethernet ports. So technically this is considered a 32 port switch. However, you can actually take all of these ports and split them out to 25 gigs, so four by 25 gigs, and get a total of 128 25 gigabit per second links on this switch. And since this is a 100 gig switch, what you would expect, and you can, is you can actually run these all at 40 gig speeds, or you can do the breakout at 10 gigabit per second as well. Now on those 10 gigabit per second side, you can also use these two SFP plus ports over here, which are 10 gigabit per second ports. On this side of the switch, we have the RJ45 serial management interface. We also have an out-of-band management port and a USB port. One of the questions that we got before when we did some of the other 100 gig switches is like, why are we even moving to 100 gig per second? And there is one side of it, which is just the you know overall advance and march of technology. But realistically, this one U form factor is a really good example. If you are using something like 40 gigabit ethernet, you still have basically these QSFP cages and the QSFP cages just take so much frontal area on a one rack unit switch like this. And because of that, realistically, you get limited to about 32. And I think Mellanox does like 36, or I guess that's NVIDIA now, it can do like 36 or so. But there's a just practical port limit to how many ports you can physically put on a 1U platform. So by moving from 40 gigabits per second to 100 gigabits per second per port, you can end up going up by, you know, basically have two and a half X the amount of bandwidth in a one rack unit switch. And that splitting out into 25 gig ethernet is also really important because that means for a server to have two 25 gig links, they only have to go and use one quarter of one of these ports rather than using a full port for 40 gigabits per second, or if they're using two 25 gig links, they get a total 50 gigabits per second by only using half of one of these ports. And that's why breaking out these ports into smaller units is actually really important as well. We're not gonna go into the whole history here, but this was largely driven by the big cloud players that said, hey, we wanna do 25 gig ethernet, we wanna do 100 gig ethernet, because those are the standards that better utilize things like PCIe lanes that we have in our servers, and then therefore also help us utilize the rest of the stack as we go up the stack. So with our 3.2 terabit per second worth of, I guess 32 times 100 gives us 32 terabits per second, but they're bi-directional ports, so it's actually a 6.4 terabit per second class switch. I think this switch is rated at something like 3.3 billion packets per second and something like 450 nanoseconds of latency. Okay, aside from the ports, let's get to the rest of the hardware. So just behind the ports, what we actually have is we have a giant heatsink. In case you're wondering, this heatsink has heat pipes. So the, the center section is where the Broadcom Tomahawk switch chip is. So you have the ASIC there, and then you actually have the kind of main heatsink area, and then you have these heat pipes and fins that kind of go out from there. Those heat pipes and fins, actually the entire assembly is 15 inches long. This is one of the longest heat sinks that we have seen in the server storage and networking gear that we review. Something that is fairly common, at least in this switch, is that you actually have a different PCB that runs the switch ASIC and your ports potentially, but then also that's separated from the control plane and the management for all the power supplies and things like fans. This switch is built a little bit differently. So we actually have the switch ASIC and that 
PCB that has a switch ASIC also has the two power supplies that go directly into that PCB. You can see the two power supplies over here. Now, technically on the spec sheet, these are rated as 500 watt units. When we pulled them out, they say they're 495 watt units and they're 80 plus platinum. Now this switch originally came out, I think in 2015, like second half, late second half of 2015, and really started hitting more volume, I think in about 2016. So an 80 plus platinum power supply was a lot bigger deal back then. Nowadays, most servers that we review have at least 80 plus platinum. So that's just something that kind of is nice, but it's not necessarily a you know world shattering feature these days. Now, if you've seen some of my other switch teardowns, you'll notice that I always kind of point out the fact that there are FPGAs that you can easily see on these things. And you might be a little bit hard on this PCB to actually see the FPGAs, but if you look under the heatsink over on this side over here, there is an Altera Cyclone FPGA that's under there because you just need it. For those wondering, there's a whole bunch of different features, like just even things like having lights blink and all those types of things that these types of platforms use FPGAs for. And so you almost always see them on any piece of you know switch gear. Now, moving behind the switching PCB, we have the control plane PCB. And this PCB is a place that Arista did something that's different but that's also going to pay a lot of dividends down the road. Specifically, instead of basing this on an Atom C2000 series chip, which I think a lot of the industry did with this generation, the Broadcom Tomahawk generation of switches, the Arista folks are actually using an AMD embedded CPU here. Hopefully I get this right, but I think it's the AMD GX 42.4cc. And as a fun little note, I think it actually has Radeon R5e graphics. And well, nobody actually cares about the fact that this has a little miniature GPU inside of it. The thing that is probably more impactful is the fact that this is an AMD product. And by not basing it on the Atom C2000 series, which is what a lot of the industry did at the time, the Arista guys actually did something that I guess maybe they even just got lucky on. And that's the fact that they didn't get hit by the AVR54 bug. In our previous Celestica 100 gig switch review, we actually talked about that bug and how with AVR54, what happens basically is that you have a you know switch, a router, a firewall, whatever it is, or just a little server that's based on an Atom C2000 series platform. And if you have one of the early chips before some of the fixes and workarounds were applied, what will end up happening is you'll power down system or reboot it or something like that and won't come back up and you'll just be left with a dead box. Now, this is not something that happens all the time, but it does happen sometimes. And if you do have an Atom C2000 series product, what you have to worry about is if you, especially if you haven't had the rework or one of the new uh, chip steppings to go fix that, what you have to worry about is, you know, potentially having a device that one day you'll go do a firmware upgrade, you'll reboot the thing, and then it just won't come back up. We've been hit by it, and it actually happened in one of our main STH firewalls a couple of years ago. And so it's something that we actually experienced firsthand. And we have seen a couple other boards that have had that happen since we published that. So it's not something that has happened by any means to all of the Atom C2000 series parts. I don't want to give anybody that impression, but it is something that if you do have a switch that has an Atom C2000 chip in it, you have to be a little bit worried about. Over time, those are expected to start failing more, and that is what we are seeing. If you haven't had that happen, just count yourself lucky. But here, by using the AMD embedded part, we don't have that issue, which is, I guess, really awesome because now I'm not as worried about this chip. It's also an x86 chip, which means that we get a lot more flexibility in terms of what network operating system we want to run. Now, you could use Arista EOS and you can get whatever licenses you want for whatever features you want. This is a pretty powerful switch still, so there are definitely options that you can go get. But the other kind of really cool thing about this is that this is a platform that Arista has Sonic support for. And so if you want to go run open networking and you want to run Sonic, you can actually do it on this switch. Years ago, when we bought 40 gig generation switches for the STH lab, we actually bought some with ARM processors. And the challenge there is just that we haven't ever been able to load a lot of these open networking things onto the switches, where if we had gotten the x86 processors at the time, which were only slightly more expensive, we would have been able to go and do that. I also just wanted to go and talk a little bit about what's on this PCB, aside from what's under that little heat sink, which is the AMD SOC. We also get two DIMM slots. These are DDR3 DIMM slots. And something that I noticed was that on the spec sheet, you know, you see things like, you know, the Broadcom switch chip has a 16 megabyte buffer and you see that the SOC here has its 
four gigabytes of memory. But when we actually looked at the unit and we opened it up, this actually has an eight gigabyte memory stick in it. I double checked the front of the system because there was a 7060CX2 32S model, which was supposed to come with eight gigabytes of memory. And this one still said CX32S. It didn't say CX232S. So I guess maybe Arista just said it doesn't cost that much more to put an eight gigabyte module in there. So why not? There are two DIMM slots, only one of them is populated. One other little feature that you're going to see in this that we haven't gotten to try out yet, but you can definitely notice it's there, is that there is an M.2 slot on this PCB. That M.2 slot has mounting points, what it looks like it's for an 80 millimeter SSD, so a 2280 M.2 SSD, or a 42 millimeter, so M.2 2242. At some point, we're probably going to try putting some extra ECC memory in here and maybe an M.2 SSD, but I kind of need this switch to work right now. And we're just kind of taking it out of the rack for a little bit. So I can't really do that because I just don't want to mess anything up. That's just the way it is. Now, behind this PCB, what you see is the headers for the fans. And the fans themselves are not overly large or anything like that. And they just plug in. They're completely hot swappable, as you would expect in a switch like this. And in case you're wondering about why they have these little red handles, and you're going to see the red handles on the power supplies as well. That is the way that you can tell whether you have front to back or back to front airflow because there's red and blue. And the way I'm always reminded of the colors on these is that, well, I usually like to have my airflow on our switches go from the power supplies to the ports, which is normally the blue version, but I always end up buying the red version because I mess up. It's weird. That's just kind of the way it is. Now, I'm sure that there are folks that are watching this video that are going to see this just giant heatsink up here, and they're going to say, wait a sec, there's a big old heatsink. There are all these fans in this thing. This must use a ton of power. And it does use quite a bit of power. It's about 187 watts. I think typical is the what Arista specs on this thing. In our use cases, we usually don't hit that high, just being frank. I think that the max power spec on this is somewhere around 333 watts. Again, the power was something like the port speed and density that the cloud guy said, hey, you know, we can actually get 200 gig for not that much more power than we're doing 40 gig and we get way higher density. So we want to have the higher speed switches and save on power. <laughs> this is really funny. So while I'm doing this video, just like right now, we have this guy that was outside and he was just going at it with his leaf blower. And it was so loud that I could see the mic levels just jump. And so I had to pause there for a little bit. So this is a little bit, it's about two minutes later than the rest of the video, just because I mean, that guy was just going at it like right outside the window over there. In terms of noise, this could actually be considered a leaf blower. It is pretty loud. It's not necessarily the loudest piece of equipment we have by any means, but it's not something that you're going to want next to, you know, in your office or anything like that. If you're just prototyping something, you're definitely going to want to put this in a data center. That's where it's made to go. So we do know that there are places in Silicon Valley and elsewhere where people will put things like this next to their engineers coding really cool projects. Don't do that. Save the hearing of your engineers. Maybe this is just total karma, but I just called this thing a leaf blower. And now there's a second guy with a leaf blower out there and they're both going at it. I don't know. Anyway, I guess that's a sign that it's definitely time to wrap this little segment up. Hopefully you enjoyed a look at the switch. Now this I mentioned was a thousand dollar ish per port when it was originally released in late 2015, early 2016. But since then the hundred gig networking is not necessarily like the highest end networking by any means. This is kind of maybe a mid to low rate end ish switch compared to what's out there these days. And so as we move to the 400 and 800 gig generation, you're going to see switches like these become a lot more commonplace and a lot less cost. We certainly did not pay anywhere near $30,000 for a switch like this. That's list price and this is enterprise. Hey guys, I hope you like looking at this switch and just kind of seeing what this generation of technology has to offer. Now, pretty soon we're going to be talking about the 400 gig and 800 gig switches. That's definitely coming on STH. We've already done a little bit in that vein. We actually looked at the barefoot or the Intel Barefoot Teams co-packaged optics demo. We did that last year. So you can go look on the STH YouTube or the STH main site for that. We'll link that in the description along with the kind of more formal STH main site piece for this switch. Again, if you've made it this far, why don't you click like, click subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos, not just on networking gear, but we cover a lot more as well. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.